Before we begin this video, I gotta make a brief apology. We're talking today about the Droid Tri-Fighter. More times than not, I am going to call it the Tri-Droid. Now, that's actually something different. The Octoptara Tri-Droid, you probably know what that is. Just know that I meant in my heart of hearts to say Tri-Fighter. I'm just not very clever. Anyway, let's roll the intro. Hey guys, this is Justin. Hello and welcome to another video. Today I want to talk about what is low-key one of my favorite ships in Star Wars, and that is the Droid Tri-Fighter. I've got to admit, I've been pretty in love with these things since their introduction in Revenge of the Sith. Actually, they were technically in the original Star Wars Clone Wars show first, but whatever. And I think the reason I like them is because unlike the somewhat goofy regular Droid Fighter, the Tri-Fighter just looks efficient. It looks deadly. It's like a small condensed mass of weaponry and speed. And not only did they look this way, the droid tri-fighter was one of the most terrifying opponents you could face off in space as a fighter pilot during the Clone Wars. Something that Anakin and Obi-Wan certainly encountered during the Battle of Coruscant. But let's talk about a bit of the lore, and one of my favorite aspects of the Tri-Droid was that it was created by the Colicoid Creation Nest, the same manufacturer who created the Destroyer Droid, a weapon of war so effective, I think, if the Separatists weren't designed to lose, they would have just pumped out en masse. Additionally, they did manufacture one of my favorite vehicle designs, and that is the Annihilator Droid, the Scorponak. But anyway, according to the Revenge of the Sith cross-section, the Tri-Droid was designed to mimic, and I quote, a prehistoric predator native to the planet Kala 4, mainly in the fact that it was incredibly deadly, but even more important, extraordinarily agile. Again, reading from the book, it says, and I quote, three independent thrusters give the craft its agility, and a powerful reactor and control comms transceiver provide unusual range for a droid fighter. What was fairly incredible as well is that the Tri-Fighter managed to pack such impressive technology in such a small frame. Over Overall, the vessel was, in all regards, smaller than something like a droid starfighter, but still managed to pack a main heavy laser cannon on the nose of the vessel, three light laser cannons on the arms which surrounded the ship, and of course, a missile launcher. This actually gives the fighter some versatility. I mean, yes, its main role is certainly going to be taking on enemy starfighters, but it can easily attack the lighter ships like the V-19 Torrent or get behind an ARC-170 and blast it with that heavy heavier main cannon, which is good. If you're a droid brain anyway, less good if you're a clone. And I know you're thinking, wow, it sure does seem like the tri-droid was pretty impressive compared to what came before. I mean, the droid starfighter never impressed me. And yeah, you would be right. This is laid out specifically in the Revenge of the Sith visual dictionary, where these droids are meant to keep the balance of power in the galaxy. The Republic was becoming too powerful with their newest generation of fighters, and ships, so Dooku and Sidious allowed the CAS to roll out not just the Tri-Droid, but also things like the Buzz Droid, which the Tri-Droid often carried. It also says specifically that the Tri-Fighter, I'm sorry that I've been saying Tri-Droid sometimes, was the arch enemy of the ARC-170 and the V-Wing, again, pointing to the versatility in those main weapons. The 2013 run of Star Wars Fact File also has some really nice additional information on the Droid Tri-Fighter. For one, it points out that unlike many droids within the CIS military, the Colicoid Creation Nest was not satisfied to have their creation slaved to a central computer. The exact design details of the Tri-Fighter are a secret, but many suspect that the droid brain is actually contained in that center section. The Tri-Fighter is weird in that that sphere, which also contained the vessel's reactor, was gyroscopically mounted. I'm not sure why, but it's an interesting fact. The one downside of the vessel is that even pushed by Palpatine and Dooku, they were incredibly expensive to make, so were typically reserved to the most important Separatist fleets, often used on defensive duties. Probably their most note of offensive duty was during the Battle of Coruscant, not only as escort to the Invisible Hand, but they were also distractions as Chancellor Palpatine was kidnapped. They did a great job defending the Invisible Hand as well, they took out several squadrons of Republic fighters, and almost Obi-Wan as well. Had the war not ended, 
ended, I can actually see a situation where, as with the super tank, for example, Palpatine basically invents a reason why the good guys no longer have to fight them. That's my speculation for the tri-droid, and that's my speculation for the super tank as well. What's interesting is that the Battle of Coruscant was not only their really main offensive feature within the Separatist Navy, it was actually the time when they were shown to the galaxy at large in significant numbers, so the tri-droids never really were out there. At Coruscant, and presumably after as well, the tri-droids worked in small teams, often in three, and using hit-and-run tactics. However, my favorite depiction of the ship, and really the purpose for making this video, actually comes from the Revenge of the Sith novelization, where we see the first-hand account of Anakin and Obi-Wan trying to survive their encounter with the pesky little enemies. According to the novel, tri-droids were the Trade Federation's latest space superiority droid. I mean, that's partially true, the Trade Federation was a part of the Confederacy, but to me, calling it a Trade Federation vessel is just kind of weird. Anyway, we learn that the droids are so dangerous because, well, although they probably can't take on a single group of Jedi, their speed and droid reflexes make them almost impossible for an ordinary pilot to outmaneuver. Obi-Wan dived right in. He had the force to guide him through, and the Tri-Fighter had only its electronic reflexes, but those electronic reflexes operated at roughly the speed of light. It stayed on his tail as if he were dragging it by a tow cable. When Obi-Wan went left and Anakin right, the Tri-Fighter would swing halfway through the difference, the same with up and down. It was averaging his movements with Anakin's. Somehow, its droid brain had realized that as long as it stayed between the two Jedi, Anakin couldn't fire on it without hitting his partner. The Tri-Fighter was under no similar restraint. No wonder we're losing the war, Obi-Wan muttered. They're getting smarter. The novel does a good job of extending lots of scenes from the movie, and the Tri-Fighter chase has to be probably the most dramatic one, but I think it was a good illustration of just how advanced CIS technology was by that point in the war. But that's all for today. I will end off with a relevant hashtag ask at question. This one comes from Gehrig Story, who says, which is worse? B2 Super Battle Droids in Republic Commando or Jackal Snipers in Halo 2 Legendary. I am going to go with B2 Super Battle Droids from Republic Commando. I recently beat Halo 2 on Legendary for, I think, actually the first time by myself. And yes, they're annoying. However, you can memorize the position of Jackal Snipers and once you figure out where they are, a bit of trial and error and you can get by. The B2 Super Battle Droids in Republic Commando are just frustrating beyond belief. They're incredibly bullet spongy. They're very basic to fight. They're just not fun. And to be honest, they're sort of representative of a lot of the issues I have with Republic Commando. And we can get in that another day. But one of my most controversial opinions is that Republic Commando is being viewed through rose tinted glasses. The game itself isn't that good. It's very, very clunky. The shooting mechanics are ass. Too many bullet sponge enemies, too many unfun sections, way too short. And the only real positives I think are sort of the little details like the visor system, the general world building, and kind of the unique tone of the game. But it's pretty short anyway. It's like four hours or five hours long, so there's not that many B2s to fight. But until next time, guys, be safe, have a good one, and may the force be with you.